All right, let's see who we can pick on today. And I got this all set up. Millennial Rain, and this is uh, listed in order from uh, the newest down. And we got David Carrico right here. So let's listen to what David has to say. Uh, I'll try my best to address these questions. Um, I'll begin with the scripture here in Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them which were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the worship of God and for, excuse me, and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And that was certainly a multifaceted question. And I will try my best to cover that uh, to the best of my humble ability. Now, in first, and I'll give you some basic principles for interpretation. There are always, uh, and always for me, it is the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ is the uh, plumb line by which I judge all things. And there's specific statements in Scripture, such as 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 25 through 26. And because of the inundation of this millennial reign teaching. So many times when we see scriptures, we can't really hear the scripture speak. We just hear what people say about it. And one of the most fundamental biblical doctrines is that Christ is reigning now in his kingdom and that he wants us to reign with him. And this is one of the great damage uh, and harm that's done by this millennial right teaching. Yeah, I know. Now I agree because um, what happens is if you say Jesus reigns for a thousand years after he returns, you're saying that he's not reigning right now and that he his reign comes to an end. And uh, just that very fact alone says you're what you're saying out of your own words is that you're not saved because Jesus is not reigning in your life right now. If Jesus is not reigning in your life right now, how can you rightly say that you are saved? But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 25 and 26, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And in verse 54, the scripture says, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So according to the scripture, Jesus is reigning now. And when he returns to swallow up death and victory, his reign ends. Now, it's... What? Wait a second. What do you say? Uh, let me hear that again, because... Meaning... Hold on a second. ...saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So, according to the scripture, Jesus is reigning now and when he returns to swallow up death and victory his reign ends I, I what is he talking about I don't understand this 
Where are you getting that at? It's not there. 54, 55, 56, 57. It's not anywhere. In fact, if that were true, you'd have to throw out the entire Bible. He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. That does not mean he's going to stop reigning. Okay. What that means is he's going to continue to reign until all of his enemies are under his feet. That's when, uh, like in uh, verse 9, when the enemy is gathered at our feet and then fire comes down out of heaven and devours them all. Right there. Okay. All right. So, um, <laughs> let's do it this way here. Um, let's, again, you cannot have one single Bible verse that contradicts Luke chapter 1, verse 33. Right? If, if you got one verse that contradicts this, then the whole thing's bad. Verse 33, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. He reigns forever and ever. All right. So, and again, even Jesus himself says the scripture cannot be broken. The scripture cannot be broken. So don't break it. Now, it's also stated in Revelation chapter 11, 15, that we see two reigns in the book of Revelation. And this is just really some pretty common sense deductions. In Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15, it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It's Handel's Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, it's just common sense. Okay, hold on a second. There's a word in there that I didn't hear. Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It's Handel's Messiah. And he it handles Messiah. I, I don't know what that means. He shall reign forever and ever. Now, it's just common sense logic. If there are two reigns in the book of Revelation, one, one is for a thousand years, and one is forever and ever. If the one forever and ever is going to be when he returns, then the one for a thousand years must be now. All right, and so, all right. Now, what he just suggested there is that this thousand years <clears throat> is a different reign, and it's not. It's not for a thousand years. It's not a thousand year reign at all. It's a time period wherein we reign with Christ while we're still in this flesh and after that which Christ has come. Christ has came. We reign with him and then he'll return. This is, it's not, a, has nothing at all to do with Jesus Christ reigning a thousand years. It doesn't have anything to do, it's not, a special time period where we are reigning uh, by our own glory you know Jesus Christ reigns forever we reign with him during this time and it's a unique time period when we are still in this flesh when he has come and before he has returned it, this is not a this idea <clears throat> that it's a thousand year reign, it, that's, not in the, that's not in Revelation 20 at all. It's not a thousand year reign. It's we reigning with Christ during this time. It's, so it's not a different reign, it's the same reign. It, Jesus reigns forever. You just read that in. Revelation 11 verse 15 and he shall reign forever and ever the only difference now are, I don't know if I, there's any there's no difference now it's just it's a unique time period because Jesus has come and we are waiting his return this 
This is not a different reign. It's the same reign. Jesus Christ reigns forever. We reign with him. It's not rocket science, man. And Jesus is reigning now, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15 and other scriptures. And the reason why... All you have to do is put the pieces together. And this is what really infuriates me, is why can't people just put the pieces together? Now you got two reigns. Right, this drives me nuts. Why not have three reigns? Because you got chapter eleven, you got chapter twenty, you got Luke chapter one. You can go on and on. And every time it mentions rain, that's a different rain. Well, if you put your brain cells together, connect the dots, you see it's all the same rain. It's not a different rain. Jesus reigns forever. That the Bible can't say, you know, Jesus is going to reign. 2,604 years is because no one knows the day or the hour. And the Bible very clearly, you even pointed this out, man. And he shall reign forever and ever. You pointed that out, David. We can know the time or the season, but we cannot know the day or the hour. But by common sense deduction, Jesus is reigning now at the right hand of the Father in the... <laughs> Uh, okay. Thousand year reign, and when he returns, he will reign forever and ever. Now, the reason he reigns forever and ever right now. Why I firmly believe that Satan is bound now. This all hinges clearly. All right. So he goes on. Uh, it talks about Satan being bound um, in. Um, and he makes note of uh, like it, it'll be he'll be loose for a little season now. Um, well, listen, let's listen to what he says because he makes a great point here on statements that were made by Jesus Christ. Anybody that listens to me at all knows that I'm all about the doctrine of Christ. If Jesus says it, I believe it, and I don't in any way interpret Scripture to in any way contradict Christ. Now, in Matthew chapter 12, and verse 29, Jesus said, Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? And this was the, the chapter where there was a conflict with the Pharisees, and he accused them of blaspheming the Holy Ghost because they said he was casting out devils by the power of bells above. And Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Jesus was bringing the kingdom, and his casting out of devils was proof of that. And he bound the strong man and cast the devils out. This is why I believe that Jesus bound the strong man, Satan, uh, he found him in his earthly ministry, and I believe it because Jesus clearly said it. Now, in the Gospel of John, chapter 12 and verse 31, there's another very, very clear statement. And the text says here, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. So Jesus said that he bound the strong man and at the cross cast him out and these are just statements that when Jesus says something I believe it I and something that I believe in my opinion uh, that dispensationalism is guilty of over and over and over is trying to use the Bible against Jesus and come up with doctrines that totally contradict what he said. Okay, yeah, so he's exactly right. Dispensationalism, that's what Mormonism is. That's what Islam is. That's But that's not what the truth is, right? So this, I completely agree, this idea of dispensationalism is an attack on the Word of God, no question about it. All right, so let's fast forward. I want to get, he just reiterates the same point and uh, he's he's right uh, he's got a good understanding um, I just have a little problem with the wording uh, in regards to Revelation 20 it's not a thousand year reign of anybody 
It's we reigning with Christ during this time. It's not a different reign. It's the Jesus Christ is reigning. It's not a different reign. It's not two different reigns. All right. I got a problem with that idea. And again, just connect the dots, man. It's all the same. All right. Just accuse you every time you mess up, just beat you up. And if you're a born again child of God, you're going to say amen to that. The accuser of the brethren still has access in the third heaven to accuse us before. All right. So, again, I got another problem with this. You know, people saying, oh, the third heaven, they're making a huge, big deal. It's like people making a huge, big deal out of the word Lucifer, and you see this mentioned one time. And, of course, it's third heaven is not in Revelation. All right, just, just so you can see that for yourself. Third, the word third and the word heaven is in Revelation 8 and 12, but those phrase third heaven, if we do it this way, You'd be able to see it clearly. One time. And it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. Now, people make way too much out of that. Way too much. For the throne of God, just like in the book of Job. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So Satan is still in the third heaven. He has not been cast. <laughs> Satan's still in the third heaven. I'm not seeing it, buddy. I'm not seeing it. Such a one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I should not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a throne in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. This is not talking about Satan being in the third heaven. Alright. You're making way too much out of it. Like making way too much out of it. There's no reason at all to say Satan's up there in the third heaven. It be, it, for one, it's not in the Bible. Alright. And for another... When we see this phrase, third heaven, the reference, the inference, excuse me, the inference is that it's paradise. And, I mean, you could start a whole debate on this, man. Oops. And say, number one, is that no man has ascended to heaven, so you can't say this is heaven. And then you, you can't say this is, uh, yeah, I think that's fair to say. You can't say this is a resurrected man in heaven. All right, so nobody's ascended to heaven, meaning nobody's resurrected up to heaven except for Jesus. All right, so, and there's a great gulf fix between the unsaved and the, and the saved. So you can't say... This is um, people that have died and ascended to heaven because that hasn't happened yet. And there's a great gulf anyway. And if there if there were a great gulf in heaven, then 
uh, Satan would not be in, in the paradise side of that. But that's not what this is talking about. I'm just pointing out the fact that if that were happening, that would not be possible. All right, there would be a problem with that. The inference, again, third heaven, paradise. All right, so making way too much out of this, in my opinion. Uh, there's no need for that. Sounds fancy, but there's no need for it whatsoever. Cast back in yet, and look at verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath a short time. Revelation 20 and 3 phrased it as a little season. He will be cast... Oh, all right, so I, I'm lost here. What are you talking about here? Has but a short time. Short time. All right, so first of all, what verse is that? Uh, he's talking about uh, Revelation 12. Uh, uh, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And the woman being uh, the nation of God, or the Christians, and the man-child, of course, being Jesus Christ. And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and a times and a half a time, from the face of the serpents. This is not the end of the world. This is happening right now. And they... And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. And then, of course, who is he that overcomes? First of all, Jesus says, uh, These things have I spoken unto you, that you might have peace, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And because he overcomes, and we believe in him, we overcome. We have overcome the world, because he has overcome the world. Ye are of God, little children, and over, have overcome them. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. See, it's always been about faith. And that's the, the secret, if you will. The key to understanding the Bible is faith. Believe that the Bible you hold in your hands is from God. Because it is. Now, back to Revelation 12. This is leading up to the end of the world. This is not the end of the world. And then, of course, in See, I appreciate the effort to connect the dots, but you're not connecting the right dots here. All right, because Revelation 20, when the devil is let loose for a little season, where are we getting that at? Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, right there. And there's actually, where's that phrase, that little season? I can't see. Right, oh, verse 3, duh, okay. So, when he's loose during this little season, this is when we are lifted up in the air. First the dead in Christ, and then those of us which are alive and remain are lifted up with them. All right, This is the judgment of God. Are you saved? Are you not saved? Those that are not saved are gathered at our feet. All right, So this little season, right here in verse 3, and then of course we go in verse... 7 and Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. This is at the end of the thousand years. At the end of the thousand years is the end of the world. This very short time period, this little season when Satan is loose, is when he gathers together the unsaved at our feet. All right, so we can go to, we see this all throughout the Bible all throughout the Bible, but I'm just going to point to one verse here. 
And behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Not them, but you. Right? So, when Satan is loosed, he gathers together the unsaved at our feet. Right? And right there it is. Verse 8. To gather them together. All right, they're going to be gathered them together at our feet, just like we read in Revelation 3. I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. And just like what we read in Genesis 3, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and it shall bruise his heel. All right, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. So this is when they are gathered together when this happens we are up in the air now it says to gather them together to battle well it's going to be a one-sided battle it's like you know if if you were to get in the ring with mike tyson during his heyday it's not going to be a fight it's going to be two hits one, him hitting you, and two, you hitting the ground. That's it. That's not much of a battle. Going to be very similar to that. It's not going to be much of a battle at all. But anyways, fire is going to come down from God out of heaven and devour them all. And that's going to be the end of all the wickedness of the world. All right, so again, um, Revelation 12, let's see if we go back there. This is... Um, about how we are being persecuted right now by the enemy of God and that's happening I mean that's obvious that's happening right and it's only going to get worse and worse until it comes to an end and this, that's what this is talking <clears throat> excuse me that's what this is talking about in Revelation 12 and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's talking about us that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not the end of the world. Revelation 20, the little season is the end of the world. That's when we are up in the air with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Anyways, um, I think that's it. No, there's one more thing. Wrath because he knoweth but he hath a short time. Revelation 20 and 3 phrased it as a little season. He will be cast back down for a short time. He'll be very angry, and this will take place in what we would call the last half of the seven. Uh, and I gotta make this point here. This so uh, Satan is bound, he's cast into the bottomless pit, and he shut up and put a seal upon him. It's important not to confuse that with other scripture, okay? Because this is a specific image being painted right here a specific vision if you will now we'll listen to what he says here he cast back down for a short time he'll be very angry he will be cast back down for a short pass back down he's already down in this image right here he's already down he's at the bottom of his pit he's down he's shut up he's there's a seal upon him he's already down in this image you're talking about another image. He'll be very angry, and this will take... Just, uh, all I'm saying is don't confuse the different visions, all right? The visions are very specific, and they have a very good purpose about each one of them, okay? Just don't confuse them, that's all. Place ...in what we would call the last half of the 70th week of Daniel, which will be three and a half years, basically 1,000. 60 days cut short because here again it's basically 1,260 days cut short alright where do it because look? here again whenever the Lord uses prophetic numbers he does it in such a way that we cannot alright so let's go back here it will take place in what we would call the last half of the 70th week of Daniel which will be three and a half years, basically 1,260 days cut short. Because here again, whenever the Lord uses prophetic numbers, he does it in such a way that...
that we cannot predict the precise. All right, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's to that last part, the numbers, uh, people make too much out of it for sure. It's just to help us get an understanding of things. Now, when you're saying three and a half years, <laughs> you're taking advantage of people that don't read their Bible. All right. And the problem is that, uh, uh, you know, That, that you're getting that idea from somebody else, not from the Bible. All right, three and a half years. Okay, so we go. First of all, let's just make this clear. All right, when you're talking about the 70 weeks of Daniel, again, I think people make way too much out of this. But let's take a look at it. Um, where can we find 70 weeks here? Uh, I actually thought that phrase was in here somewhere. Is it not in here? Boy, maybe I need to read the Bible. Huh? Oh, no, it's right there. What was I looking right at it? Didn't see it? Alright, so. 70 weeks are determined upon the people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. Who makes an end of sins? And who makes reconciliation for iniquity? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he brings in everlasting righteousness. And to seal up the vision, prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Jesus has done that, right? Don't, don't forget that. It's kind of important. Know therefore and understand that. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks. Who rebuilt Jerusalem? Who rebuilt Jerusalem? the holy temple it's Jesus he destroyed it and in three days he built it back up and remember the conversation I think people just for whatever reason cannot remember 40 and 6 years we've been building this doggone place and you're gonna rear it up in three days are you out of your cotton pick in mind are you crazy but that's exactly what Jesus did now, he wasn't talking about, you know, stone and uh, mortar and that sort of thing. He was talking about rebuilding the body. He rebuilt the body, which is the temple, and we have everlasting life through him because he has led the way. He's built the new temple, and we that believe in him are born of the Spirit of God, and we shall be delivered into this new temple that he has made for us which is an incorruptible body a body that de desires no sin has no sin has no sorrow no pain no suffering no more death okay Jesus rebuilt the temple this is not at all anything to do with this idea of a third temple none whatsoever okay and know and therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks three score two weeks the street shall be built up again and the wall even in troublous times this is talking about Jesus rebuilding the body all right and after three score in two weeks which is 62 weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself and the people of the prince shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the air and the end there of shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war and unto the end of the war desolations are determined now when the temple is destroyed that's when he died okay very simple and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease so not only did he just rebuild the temple upon his death but he offered his body as a as a sacrifice as an offering to God as an atonement for our sins so that whosoever believes in him shall never perish but have everlasting life his body is an offering to God to cover our sin 
and he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. So no longer do, do they need to go and you know make daily sacrifices and offering of the blood of bulls and goats. That that has come to an end. It came to an end upon his death because his death did it all. That was that the the offering of the the old in the Old Testament, the offerings that they if I could just go to Hebrews eleven, I think that would be easier. Hebrews ten, what is, that's why. It's because I don't know the Bible. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Uh, chapters 9 and 10 go over that very very well all right so those sacrifices were never sufficient it was only by the sacrifice of the son of god that was that could be that could be sufficient and jesus offered his body for atonement of all sin not just ours only but for the sins of the whole world all right, so when he died and offered his body, that all those sacrifices came to an end. The sacrifices and oblations to cease, and for the overspreading of abomination, which they also did, he shall make it desolate. No more is that needed. No more is that being asked of. Even until the consummation, which is, is his return, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. The un, the, that determined is death uh, poured upon the desolate which is those that do not believe those that have not been born of the Spirit of God all right so people making way too much out of this I'm not kidding you and then let's go to um, what is that is that 12 or 11 maybe 10 maybe it's 13 Oh wait, there is no 13. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's 12. All right, so he, because he mentioned 1260 days, I do believe. Let's make sure. Which will be three and a half years, basically 1260 days cut short. Which will be three and a half years, basically 1260 days. 1260 days. Innocent mistake. All right, he. To, it's an innocent mistake. Twelve thousand. I'm sorry, twelve thousand. I made a mistake. A thousand two hundred and ninety days. Not sixty days. Ninety days. Because look at the next verse here. Blessed is he that waits and comes to the thousand three hundred in five and thirty days which is 45 days after this okay so this is the end of the world all right and then if you're not saved the you know the wicked are destroyed at the end of this 1290 days the wicked are destroyed blessed is he that waits and comes to the 1335 days all right because that means you were spared or saved from the wrath that is to come right so this is when you are lifted up in the air this is all the same thing that we're reading all throughout the bible we are lifted up in the air to be with the lord first the dead in christ and those of us which are alive and remain and the enemy is gathered at our feet and destroyed this is at the end of the 1290 days and everybody that in goes endures or uh, lives through that I should say endure might be a confusing word for you uh, but I apologize for that so whoever is remains uh, after the wrath is poured upon the unsaved and all wickedness then blessed is he that waits so if you lit if you make it to uh, 1335 you're gonna make it to 75 75 and you're going to make it forever right this everlasting life 
In fact, if you are born of the Spirit of God right now, you've already made it past that, okay, and forever. You already have eternal life. Blessed is he, a way to come to the 1,305 and 30 days, but go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. Uh, so again, this 1290, uh, this is sort of confirmation that the 1290 is the end of of the world all right so anyways uh, nothing at all here about three and a half years nothing at all you know, people make them way too much out of it way too much three and a half years not in the Bible not in the Bible anywhere at all let's confirm that three and a half years nope that's not it what you mean is three and a half days And, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. Again, has nothing at all to do with what you're talking about. Um, people are making way too much out of stuff. And I could get into, I could get into that, but I'm not going to. Alright, let me just say this. Let me point out to this one verse. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as, as a thousand days, and a thousand days is one day. This has nothing to do with Bible prophecy whatsoever. All right. If you're trying to take that and apply it to other verses, you're missing what this is saying. God can see one day as though it were a thousand years. He can break down every millisecond throughout the course of the entire day. He can also look at a thousand year of time as though it, just in a moment, as if he popped it in the VCR and, and he watched, watched it all happen in one day. And he can see the beginning from the end. He can see it all. That's what this means. This has nothing at all to do with interpreting Bible prophecy nothing at all anyway so I'm gonna end on that um, I, want, I will say that I do like you know for sure I like David Carrico I, I don't know everything that he preaches I hope he preaches once saved always saved if he's if he doesn't he's eternally lost but uh, I notice he's quoting from the King James Bible and he's got the thousand years correct and that it's happening right now to me, I think uh, there's not enough people that are awake to this yet because there's so many false teachers out there that are preaching this dispensationalism, which is of the devil. There's no doubt about it. The biggest problem I have with it is you're telling people they can wait until after Jesus comes to start believing him. And that's not true at all. If you're going to be saved, you have to be saved today. You cannot wait another day. It has to be right now. If your life ended tonight it, and you're not saved, it's over forever, for all eternity. If you wait until, if Jesus comes tonight, it, then it's over and you're not saved, it's too late. For all eternity, you have no shot at all to have everlasting life. Your only opportunity is right now really to believe and I mean come on you don't have to go out there and give 20 bucks to your Reverend Schmitty you don't have to go you know help some old lady at, you know walk across the street even though the, that would be nice if you did that uh, what am I looking for here today is the day of salvation that's what I'm looking for you know the, so the point is that I want to make is just, all you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that he has done it all for you because he has. You're not a good person. The scripture has concluded all under sin. What's the verse I'm looking for? I can't think and talk at the same time. This day is salvation come. This day is salvation. That's pretty good right there, isn't it? That's not the verse I'm looking for, but that's good enough. We're going to end it right there. All right, so 
again, I you know I like David Carrico, very thoughtful gentleman. Um, but uh, I think you know he's making a little bit too much out of stuff that he doesn't need to. All right, and there's again there's one reign of Jesus Christ. There are not two reigns. That stuff is going to drive me bonkers. All right. So, anyways, appreciate. Uh, anybody tuning into this if you think I'm too hard on Dave let me know um, and you have any other feedback I always appreciate it